I noped this comment, pause to read. Some of you didn't appreciate that I replied with a simple nope instead of engaging with it, and I just didn't want to. But I can understand why that would be annoying to some of you readers of the comments. So here we go. There's a lot in this comment, so let's commence with the first holy note breakdown of an Instagram comment. I'm convinced that you aren't able to fundamentally grasp what's being presented. You show an inability to understand the point of some of the clips you choose, creating straw man arguments repeatedly. It would have been great here, brother, to have an example of when I've straw manned someone. But fortunately, we have an accusation without any evidence presented. I never want to straw man anybody. My question to you is, have you seen any more of the context of this clip? Have you watched a longer clip? Have you seen the sermon? I think the vast majority of people who say I'm taking something out of context have absolutely no idea because they haven't seen any more of that clip themselves. And then despite not having seen any more, will try to interpret it in a way that makes sense out of what's being said, which is strangely ironic because now you're the one who's taking it out of context. As I've said before, I hope my followers will come to trust that I have either considered seriously the context of what I am posting or I am posting something that no conceivable context could support biblically according to my understanding of the scriptures and my conscience before God. He's not discounting or discrediting the power of God's word. He's pointing out that non-believers do not care what the Bible says. Is there power in God's word to save sinners or should we not proclaim it because non-believers don't care? I'm confused. I found this portion of the comment quite nonsensical. You said that it's, uh, it's not because they don't like honey, which is God's word, but above you just said they don't care about God's word. You quote 1 Corinthians 118 that it's foolishness to those who are perishing. I'm really not understanding you at this point. Is this an argument to not preach the word to non-believers because it's perceived as foolish? Because that's certainly not what Paul is saying in that context. In verse 23, he says, we preach Christ crucified. And Paul certainly was engaged in the work of public proclamation among non-believers, uh, both Jews and Gentiles. You then attempt to tie 2 Peter 3, 9 to this verse. Talk about taking something out of context, uh, but 2 Peter 3, 9 is another video. You disagree with street preaching, fine, whatever. I'm not going to address that anymore in this video. If you want to see more content about the biblical case for open air preaching, follow my other channel at The Holy Herald. I'll tag myself in the description. Description. You actually said that the Holy Scripture is the only certain, sufficient, and infallible rule. Yeah, I was quoting the 1689 Second London Baptist Confession of Faith, to which I subscribe. It says the Holy Scripture is the only sufficient, certain, and infallible rule of all saving knowledge, faith, and obedience. So I didn't say anything new. This is what Christians have believed for a long, long time. And I didn't say it's the only adequate starting point for salvation, whatever that might mean. I said it's the only adequate starting point for engaging non-believers evangelistically. Because what is evangelism? Well, the word comes from the Greek, euangelion, meaning good news or gospel. Evangelism, then, is the spreading of the gospel. You can't even begin to do that without saying what the Bible says. If you have not used words to explain or proclaim the gospel to someone, then you have not evangelized. Evangelized. That would have made it tough for the apostles since the Holy Scriptures, as you define it, did not even exist in the days that the church was born. It's because of the power and demonstration of the Holy Spirit and the fellowship of the believers. My friend, you mentioned fellowship, which I assume is a loose reference to Acts 2.42, which says they were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. It says to the apostles' teaching. What do you think the apostles were teaching. They were following the example of their Lord and teaching the scriptures. Luke 24, 45, then Jesus opened their minds to understand the scriptures. In Peter's sermon at Pentecost, there are at least a dozen references or allusions to the Old Testament scriptures, and Peter begins that sermon by basically saying, the Bible says, Acts 2, 16. This is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. Every monologue in Acts is saturated with the Old Testament, yes, even Acts 17. And when Paul says in 2 Timothy 3, 316, that all scripture is God-breathed and profitable, he is, of course, speaking about the Old Testament. So I'm not sure what you mean by, as you define it, but to suggest that scripture didn't exist for the early church is simply incorrect. Lastly, consider your slanderous implications. You imply that he does not believe the Bible and its stories to be true. God hates this. Get help. I could be wrong, but this part here suggests to me that you haven't seen any more context to this clip before commenting this, and yet you still offered an interpretation of Andy's meaning. But again, that would make you the one taking this clip out of context. Or maybe not, right? I mean, surely Andy Stanley would never suggest that parts of the Bible and its stories aren't true. And so we went off to college, and we discovered that even though it was sacred, it wasn't scientific. 
And even though, you know, it was something to appreciate, it wasn't necessarily something that was factual. And even though there were stories in here that were inspirational, they weren't necessarily true. Nope. Mm -mm. I feel like I'm losing my mind. Is everybody in the world blind? Please, Lord, give me a sign, a sign. 